start streaming. All right. So in today's lab, we're going to do the counterpart of uh, what we started last in the, in the previous class. So this one is going to deal with positive exponents instead of negative exponent of 10. But the approach is about the same. Okay. So what we'll do is we're going to take a look um, on the tablet. And I'll just kind of briefly go over the math of that. I think I did go over some of that math, but we'll go over, you know, make sure that we got enough covered before you can uh, start on that. So we'll go back to restart the tablet screen. This is from the pre from the other class. I'm gonna back out of that. Back out of that here. Tuesday, Thursday. There we go. All right. So what we want to do is we're going to look into how to deal with a positive exponent of 10 instead of a negative exponent of 10. Okay. That's going to be due one week from today. So you do have two active assignments, you know, overlapping. Um, most of the time when people can get done with one, the other one is pretty easy because it's kind of the same concept except it's apl applied in a reverse way. All right. So um, let's go ahead and, and think of a particular case. So let's say the mantisa is, you know, 67, okay? And then the exponent of 10, uh oh, uh, there we go. And then the exponent of 10 is, now when the exponent of 10 is small, it's not a problem. For instance, if the exponent of 10 is only two, okay, it's pretty easy to deal with that um, because you just have to say, oh, okay, we'll multiply 67 by 100, okay? That allows you to subtract 2 from the exponent of 10, and you're pretty much done, other than you're having to make it as big as possible to fill up all 64 bits, okay? So the only problem, the problem happens only when exponent 10 is too big, so that the resulting numbers cannot fit into a 64-bit integer anymore. Then you have a problem. Then you're forced to have to sh use a bit shifting or division by two to free up enough room to deal with more um, multiplication by 10. So we'll deal with a number that is too big that we cannot handle without that technique. Um, 24 would do it, okay? So 24 is not even that much of a problem, you know, but it will trigger th that logic. Because if you think about, you know, 67 times 10 to the power of 24, it's going to take up 26 digits, right? And we know that a 64-bit um, unsigned integer can be represented. The largest value of that is only 20 digits in decimal. So this is way too big to fit into a 64-bit integer, and we are going to be forced to have to rely on um, your bit shifting, make enough room, do another multiplication by 10, and then bit shift a whole bunch again you know, to make room. Is that okay? More or less? Okay. Okay, so given that is what we need to do, um, then we're gonna do this in a, in a way that you know, it is mm, somewhat resembling what you need to do with your homework. Okay. So we'll start up. Oh, I got it already here. So this is this is the advantage of not uh, shutting down my machine because you know it, it's already here. Remember this, you know, familiar project. Well, we're gonna work on this one. Except you know, this time we are dealing. We're gonna have to deal with a really large, you know, positive uh, exponent of ten. But the objective is still the same. We still want the mantisa to fill up all 64 bits. In other words, bit 63 of the mantisa should be a 1 when this is all done. We also want to preserve the value represented. Okay? We want to get exponent 10 to down to 0. But the rest we can play with. Okay? So we can play with the exponent of 2. Uh, we can also play with the mantisa itself. So let me go you know, change my project um, program argument. So this time I'm going to use a, well, 6.7. And on the tablet, because it says, you know, exponent of 10 is 24, I'm going to use this as 25, okay? So 6.7e25 as a 
scientific notation in base 10 is really saying 67 times 10 to the power of 24, okay, because I just shift one of the exponents, you know, to multiply the mantissa by 10, you know, the other way. So we are still working with the same example. Is that okay? All right, so we'll click, you know, okay, and then we rerun the program from the beginning because the program is already running at this point. So we say stop debugger, and we go start and now we're back to the same breakpoint. So at this point in the uh, debugger terminal, we'll go ahead and just say print um, whatever PN is pointing to. And it says, you know, Mantisa is 67, exponent of 10 is 24. Okay, so we, we have it now. Um, do you think I can multiply the Mantisa by 10 without overflowing it at this point? The mantissa, by the way, is a 64-bit unsigned integer. So how do you know that we have room to multiply the mantissa by 10 without overflowing? Well, not so much. You know, but if you look at the mantissa, it's 67. Uh, if you multiply 67 by 10, it is 670. So do you think 670 can be represented in a 64-bit unsigned integer? But how do you know that? Okay, so we need to somehow you know, know what is the largest integer that we can represent. Um, that the next um, multiplication by 10 is going to exceed the limit. That is what we need to know. Okay, so let's let me switch back to the tablet and show you the equation or the inequality that we have to solve. Uh, where's my tablet? There, right there. Okay, so what we're looking at here is we are. We want to keep multiplying the mantissa by 10, and then we also want to, at the same time, uh, decrement the exp 10 by 1. Yeah, that's m. Yeah, it's assignment. I use this symbol you know, to emphasize that we are. this is an assignment operation as opposed to a comparison operator. Yep. The syntax of C is awful for that sort of thing. It uses a single equal sign for assignment, and then use double equal for comparison. So to you know, someone who's just starting to learn C and C++ programming, that can be like awfully confusing. Especially if that person has a math background, because in math, guess what? Equals to is always comparison. There's no such thing as assignment operation in mathematics. So that's why I always use a left arrow to indicate that we are changing the left-hand side to whatever the right-hand side is which is the same thing as a single equal in C. Okay, so we want to keep doing this until what? Until m times 10 is going to be an integer that is too large to represent in a 64-bit integer. Okay, so the condition that we want to watch out for, so we'll, uh, we'll say, you know, as long as, okay, and I'll use the original intent first, okay? So as long as m times 10, okay, is still representable, which means it is still less than or equal to the maximum unsigned u int 64 value, then we can keep doing this, right? Does that make sense? As long as the mantissa times 10 is less than or equal to the largest value we can represent in 64 bits, we can still do this. There's still room to multiply the mantissa by 10 one more time, at least, right? But that's a problem. Th there's a little problem here because of this comparison. This comparison is always going to be true. Everything is less than or equal to max u in 64. Why is that the case? Yep. If you overflow it, then it cannot, once you overflow it, you know, we don't know exactly what the value is going to be once it overflows, but we know it cannot be greater than the maximum integer you can represent as a 64-bit number. So we have a little problem here. How do we solve that problem? What the, the problem is m times 10 
can result in a quantity that cannot be represented by a unsigned 64-bit integer. And we do not have 128-bit integers. Yep. Yep, divide both sides by 10, right? So we just say, ah, we can do it like this. That's cool, we can do that, right? Because you know, you end the maximum value of unsigned 64 uh, bit integer divided by 10 is, well, I mean, it's just another you know 64 bit integer and we can compare that to M. As long as M is less than or equal to that, we can, we have enough room to multiply that by 10 again at least for one more iteration. Is that making any sense? Okay. Um, so when we exit this loop, what does it mean when we exit this loop? Well, m is greater than, right? m is greater than max u in uh, uh, 64 uh, uh, divided by 10. So what are we going to do? Because you know, at that point, you know, what if exponent of 10 is still uh, non-zero at that point. Now, if exponent of 10 is zero already, we are good. What if it's not? So what, what do we do? Okay, so I'm going to say what if exp10 is still greater than zero after when the loop exits. I can no longer multiply the mantissa by 10, so I can't just do that anymore. So what do we need to do? We need to make room. Yep, go ahead. Say that one more time. We have to use exp2 to adjust for it. In other words, at this point when um, the mantissa is already as big as we can possibly get. Another multiplication by 10 will overflow. What we need to do now is to say, well, let's see if we can make room for another multiplication by 10 by dividing the mantissa by 2. We'll keep dividing the mantissa by 2 until we, get, we have enough room. Now, how does that work? And by the way, uh, this condition here, should be this and exp10 is still greater than zero because if exp10 is zero already, we can just exit the loop. We don't, we don't need to keep going um, because the objective is to keep, uh, make exp10 equal to zero. Okay, so if exp10 is still greater than zero, then we have to do some division by two, okay? So division by two, looks like this. Don't write it down because I'm going to do something here. But this is a division without rounding. This is truncation or we know it as flooring. Okay. So once again, what is the problem of only using a floor function t when we perform a division? <coughs> yep. Sorry? No room for remainders. That is not the exact reason. There are two alternatives. You can either floor or you can round, okay? Because the result has to be stored back into an integer. And we know that m divided by two may not be an integer or whole number itself. So we got two options. We can either floor, which makes, you know, with basic, which basically means we're truncating. We are forgetting the entire fractional part. Or we can round, which means we are saying, okay, let's see which integer is closer to what we want, okay? Uh, so sometimes it's going to be less than what it really should be, and sometimes it's larger than what it should be. So which way should we use and why? Yep, exactly. So that's the rationale of rounding instead of truncating. Okay, truncating is the same thing as using the floor function. So this is by, de by default a truncation because that's what integer div division would do in C and C++. Okay, 
and it has what we call a bias, a unidirectional bias, which means every time you perform this operation, that's an, that's a, that's an error, okay? But the error is always in one single direction. So the, if you do this several times, then your error becomes bigger and bigger and bigger until you know, the value is really gonna be different from what it should be. So we need to round it. But we talked about how to do rounding without actually using the 0.5 thing. So the key to do that is to say, I'm gonna add one half of the denominator first to m, and then we do the division by two. So that would do the rounding. Okay, this is already talked about multiple times. It's in the modules as well. So if this is looking a little bit foreign, it might be a good time to review the notes and or the previous lectures, okay? So by doing this, I'm doing the rounding, but this is all integer arithmetics. Integer addition, integer division, so both are fairly fast on the modern processor, so it's, it's good, okay? But when you divide the uh, mantissa by two, you have to adjust the exponent of two by increasing it. Because we don't want the value represented to change, we just want to kind of play with the mantissa so that we have enough room to um, do another multiplication by 10. Is that okay so far? because that's how we do rounding. So, okay, so this means, you know, it's probably a good time to show you where in the notes we talk about this. So if you go to floating point number representation and go to, there's one section that talks about rounding in general. So if you go to, okay. Okay, so you want to read this part here. So this entire part is, uh, talks about the mechanical aspect of you know, why we can just add half of the denominator to the numerator and then divide the whole thing by the denominator. And the floor function is automatic with integer division. So we are always doing a truncation anyway. But in order to turn it into a rounding kind of function, you just have to add one half of the denominator. Unfortunately, in our case, the denominator is either two or 10. In both cases, it's an even number. So an even number divided by two is also a whole number, and that's why we can use this trick and without having to use any type of actual floating point calculation in this process. Okay, so, so for the details and rationale and stuff like that, you know, read the notes. But for now, what we're gonna do is just kind of move on to talk about the algorithm itself, okay? All right, so do we only do it once? Mm, maybe not, okay? So we don't know exactly how many times we have to do it. We just know that we have to keep doing this until there's room for another multiplication by 10. So what is the condition if we stick this into a loop, what is the condition to get out of the loop? Okay, so I'm gonna do this in multiple iterations. So we'll say as long as, okay, I'm gonna use bad English here. Oops, bad spelling too. That goes along with uh, you know, bad English, okay, fine. Okay, does that make sense to you? As long as there ain't enough room for another multiplication by 10, we'll, we'll, we'll divide you know, the mantissa by two. Because you know, by dividing the mantissa by two, the mantissa becomes a smaller value. Then you say, okay, do we have an room for another multiplication by 10? Not yet, divided by two again. Okay, until you go like, oh, the mantissa is now small enough that it has room for a multiplication by 10. Is that okay? So how do we know whether we have enough room for another multiplication by 10? Yep, just flip the other condition up there. This condition says, you know, um, as long as there is enough room, keep multiplying by 10. So what, what do you think it would look like when we say, as long as there isn't enough room? 
flip it, right? Negate it. Yep. So what do you do after you get out of this loop? In other words, you keep dividing the mantissa by two until there is enough room, okay? And eventually you get out of this loop. What does it mean when you get out of this loop? Well, let's think about it, okay? The condition to stay in the loop is when there ain't enough room. So when you get out of the loop, what does it mean? There is enough room, right, to get out of loop. So what do you do when there is enough room and exp tend is still non-zero? <laughs> and then you do it again, right? So you keep doing this until exp10 is zero. Is that okay? All right. <coughs> So is the basic idea, you know, clear on what your algorithm needs to do conceptually? Okay. So if that is the case, let's go back here and see if we can do something about it here. All right. So I need to multiply the mantissa by 10 and um, decrease the exponent by 10 until there's not enough room for another multiplication. Okay. So I can use set var, okay? This is just me using the debugger to do this, okay? So we can say set var um, mantissa um, multiply equals to 10. And then we have um, exp 10 um, minus equal one, okay? And then we want to see uh, whether it is there's still enough room or not. So how do we check that? Okay, let's go back to the tablet. So the tablet says the condition is to compare the mantissa to the maximum value that a u unsigned integer, 64 bit unsigned integer can represent, and then the whole thing divided by 10. Uh, how do we find that value? In your current assignment, you probably need to refer to something like that already, right? So there are four ways to do this. There's the very painful way. There's the slightly painful way. There is the deceptively simple way. And there's the right way. <laughs> okay? You guys are more creative than I am, so you can probably think of other ways to do it too. But we'll, we'll go over those four ways, okay? To find the maximum unsigned 64-bit integer, what does it look like? Okay, so the maximum u in 64 value by the def by the definition of how we represent integer is two to the power of 64 minus one. Okay, so you go like, hmm. Okay, we can just you know, put that into a calculator and copy the value. Well, let's try that and see what it looks like. Okay, so we use a spreadsheet. I'm pretty sure I got a spreadsheet up somewhere. There we go. Eh. I'll just abuse this you know, spreadsheet for now by you know, opening, adding a new tab to it. Okay, because I just want to know what it looks like. So it's the power of two to the 64 in the whole thing minus one. And it only gives me kind of like a scientific notation, which is not what I want, okay? So you can say, okay, let's make the cell, you know, longer, and it will format the cell. Okay, where's format? Okay, I guess I, we have to go to format here, and number, and we are not gonna go for automatic, and we'll go for, okay, that's just, Scientific itself. I'm trying to maximize the precision. So we'll go to more formats and we'll go for custom. And we're gonna maximize you know the the accuracy of this thing. Okay, we say apply. There we go. Alright. So even though you know the the number is using the format of using a whole gazillion of you know fractional digits for the mantissa, you can see you can see that it doesn't look right. There's a whole bunch of zeros. Why do you think that is the case? 
how many of the digits of the mantissa are not zeros? Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay, only fifteen of those digits are um, non-zeros, and then the rest are all padded zeros. Why do you think that is the case? What does it tell you about the internal representation of um, of the spreadsheet? It's not using a 64-bit integer, okay? And then you think about, but how many bits of precision are we talking about here when we are talking when, when we have what 15 or 16, you know, base 10 digits? So the question is, how many bits are actually used for that precision? What do you think? Can we do a guesstimate? Yep. It's about 52. Okay, 52-ish, 53, okay? So how do I know that, okay? Now, I have a reason for suspecting that, but I can back up my suspicion with actual numbers, okay? Okay, so let's count again so I can get an actual number of base 10 digits. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. There are 15 digits exactly, okay? So the way I work it out, okay, switching back to the tablet, okay, and we'll move this up a little bit. So we have 15 base 10 digits, okay, and I want to find out how many bits, you know, is needed in order to express the same precision, okay, to, to express the same um, number of possibilities, okay. So what we do is we do an estimate and we say 2 to the power of 10 is approximately 10 to the power of 3. Let me buy that. It's only approximate. I mean, it's not exactly the same. What is 2 to the power of 10? 1,024. So 1,024 is not exactly 1,000, but it's pretty close. So for estimation purposes, I would just go like, yeah, that's close enough, okay? So now the question is, how many 10 to the power of 3 do we have in 15 base 10 digits? If you have 15 base 10 digits, you have approximately 5, or 10 to the power of 3, and then the whole thing to the power of 5. Is that making any sense? Which is equivalent to 2 to the power of 10, and then the whole thing to the power of 5 again. So that gives you about 50 bits. And how many bits do we allocate to the mantissa in the double? 52 bits, okay? So it's actually pretty right along that ballpark because you can't tell exactly the number of bits because each base 10 digit can contain between three to four digits. So when we get to like 50 digits, it's like, okay, we're in the right ballpark, okay? So this tells me that uh, Google Spreadsheet internally uses a double to represent numbers because you know, the precision or how the limitation of the precision is consistent with 52-ish you know, bit of uh, precision of the mantissa. Okay, so this is not gonna work. All right, so if this is not gonna work, you know, remember what we wanna do is to get to this number. So what is the next way of doing this? You can use a calculator because you know your own calculator probably can has a has more precision than a double. So that might actually give you the entire number. Okay? But it's gonna be a pretty long number with about nineteen digits. 18 to 19 digits, and copying that, those 19 digits, you know, uh, by hand is not a whole lot of fun. So this is the painful way. <laughs> okay, so let's think of a less painful way to do it. So now the question is, um, what is 2 to the power of 3 minus 1? Because we want to find a pattern, okay? Because once we find a pattern, then we go like, oh, okay, so we know how to get to it. 2 to the power of 3 minus 1 is 7 in base 10. What is 7 in binary? It has a 4, 
it has a two, then it has a one, right? So that makes it one, one, one in base two. Because it's got a one, 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 two, and a one, four, right? Okay, that seems kind of coincidental, doesn't it? Let's think about uh, two to the power of two to the power of four minus one. What is that? Two to the power of four is sixteen. Sixteen minus one is fifteen. And how do we represent fifteen? Now the trick to do this is to think about we know what seven is already, right? How does fifteen relate to seven? It's different by eight. And what is eight? It's the power of two, right? So if one, one, one in base two represents seven, one, 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 one in base two represents 15. Oh, okay. So that means two to the power of 64 minus one is gonna be 64 ones as a binary number. Does it make sense? Do you see how the, uh, this is not a proof, okay? But it is an idea, a conjecture to basically say, we can extend that reasoning so that you know, two to the power of n, the whole thing minus one, is really just n ones as a binary number. Okay, so we need to write 64 ones. Well, we can't even do that because C does not uh, have a prefix for binary numbers. Darn it. But, ba but C has what base? What numbers can you specify in, in, in C? We have base 10, and then what else? Hmm? I think I heard the right answer. Hexadecimal, very good. And what base is it again? 16, okay, it's base 16. Uh, why is base 16 so cool? How does it relate to base two? Well, first of all, how does 16 relate to two? Don't tell me it's two plus 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 two. Okay, how does 16 relate to two? That's a power, okay? Two to the power of four is 16. So that tells you a single digit in base 16 represents four digits in base two. And that's why we have that table, okay? We spell out every single digit in base 16 and then we spell out all the four bit patterns each digit in base 16 is representing. So do you remember what 1111 maps to? It's the letter F, or what we know as 15 in base two, in base 10, okay? So that means you know, this value is zero X, which is the prefix of a hexadecimal number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That represents the bit pattern of the largest integer value in, in hexadecimal. So this is the second most painful way to do it because you have to count the number of Fs. Okay, so, so we, we, we have explored two ways now. The third way is deceptively simple. What do I mean by de deceptively simple? It's just that, but you cast it. Now this is deceptively simple, and it's code that is also kind of self-contradictory, because if you think about it, this is like, it doesn't make sense, because the value is negative one, but I'm casting it to an unsigned 64B integer. It just doesn't make sense, right? But it works. So, well, just to find out that it works, let's verify that first. So we go back to code blocks, and then we use the command line of GDB again, and we say, tell me what is u int 64 underscore t as a typecast of negative one. Do you, do you think that's about uh, a 64, the largest 64-bit number? How do you, if I just do, if I were to ask you, without using a calculator, without using actual math, how do you know this is actually representing, or at least, you know, there's a good, re good probability that this is representing the largest value you can represent in 64 bits? How would you do that? Remember that trick that we talked about earlier? Two to the power of 10 is about 10 to the power of three. 
Remember that? So we count the number of digits first. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There are 20 digits here, okay? And every 10 bits can account for about three digits in base 10, okay? So 1, okay, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60, okay? So not counting the 1, 8, the most significant two digits, I am saying, okay, you know, the other parts account for 60 uh, bits already. And then we have a 1, 8. 1, 8 is a little bit more than 16, and 16 requires four bits to represent. So, you know, so you can kind of guesstimate, oh, this is kind of like between 64 and 65 bits. But that's a confirmation that this is pretty much as big of a number you can represent in 64 bits as possible. You know, this is the largest value. Okay. That's basically just using, you know, like a guesstimation, you know, based on the 2 to the power of 10 is about 10 to the power of 3 to estimate, you know, how, what is the magnitude of this number in terms of number of bits. You, you, this is not very useful, you know, or it doesn't seem to be very useful, you know, this kind of way to kind of think about things. Um, but when you go buy something like, you know, how many terabytes and stuff like that, you know, it's, it actually comes in pretty handy. For instance, does it make sense to install 16 gigs of RAM when your processor only has a 32-bit bus? And why not? And how do you know that? <laughs> because 32 has three tens, right? So there are, there, it's two to the power of 10 and then that whole thing to the power of three, which is approximately two, th 10 to the power of three and then that whole thing to, to the power of three. So you can, you can kind of measure, you know, the number of bits needed to address 16, 16 gigabytes and the 32 bit bus just cannot do it. So that stuff kind of come in handy so that, you know, the, your, the Dell salesman cannot, you know, convince you over the phone and go like, yeah, you need, you know, this much RAM, but my processor won't be able to address all that. Okay, so, so getting back to here, the other way to confirm this is to print it in hexadecimal. And I'm fairly convinced that there are 16 Fs here, but if you guys want to count, you can you know, replay the video, freeze the frame, and then do the counting yourself. <laughs> okay? So, so, that, so the third way does work, okay? You know, casting negative one into a 64-bit unsigned integer actually works. Why does it work? Remember the number wheel thing? Okay? Now, with 64 bits, that wheel is gigantic with lots and lots of values in between, right? But what you do remember is when zero is 12 o'clock um, and I want to rotate it, um, if, I ro what, if I want to move the needle counterclockwise by one slot, what is that? It's negative one, but it's also the largest unsigned value because it is the same thing as going clockwise almost the entire turn short for one click, okay? So that's why this trick works, because the representation of negative one as a signed 64-bit integer is identical to this huge number represented as an unsigned 64-bit number. Is that okay? So I'm going through all of this stuff to help reinforce, you know, the understanding of signed versus unsigned numbers, because guess what? That's going to be on the test on Thursday. So I'm helping you to study a little bit here. Okay, so what is, the, what is the proper way? You know, because we talked about three ways of doing this already. So what is the proper way to do it? Well, for that, let's ask Google. Make sense, right? <coughs> now, when you use Google, there's using Google and then there's using Google. Because the way to use Google is to know what words you're looking for. So U in 64 seems to be important because you know, that type 
was used in the actual code. And it's a very unlikely name to be colliding with some other concepts, right? Okay, so that seems to be useful. Um, we want to find the maximum, right? So max is kind of important. And you can see that you know, Google automatically you know, suggests. Um, are you really asking about the maximum value in UIN64 underscore T? Okay, that seems pretty reasonable. Click on that. And it gives you a bunch of stuff. Um, and then we can click on this one, you know, because the first link you know, typically already has what we're looking for. So you click on that link and go like, I'm not gonna read all that. <laughs> Which is probably what happens to my notes. Right, the modules that I have written, you know, click on and go like, ah, I'm not gonna read that. But wait, the exam is on Thursday. <laughs> Maybe I need to kind of you know, tie myself down and actually start reading that stuff. Okay, so I look at this and go like, oh, this is really a lot of stuff, okay? And where is the one thing that I need to know? What was it about again? U in 64, right? So you use another feature of a browser, Control F, and you say, tell me about U in 64. Where are those things? Oh, we got a few on the page right now. There's one, which is the type itself, and there's another one here. What is that saying? Okay. So it says, for example, int 8 underscore t and u in 64 underscore t, amongst others, could be declared together with defining their corresponding ranges. Okay, so with a signed integer, it has two ranges because the minimum is negative, it's not zero. That's why it has a macro definition for that. And then the other one is zero to, oh, do you think that relates to what we are looking for? It's exactly what we are looking for. Okay, so it's u in 64 underscore max. If you have any doubts about that name, you can just search for that name and find out you know, what it is and confirm that it is actually the representation of the largest 64-bit unsigned value. Is that okay? So what I'm doing is to make you guys or try to teach you the skills so that you won't need me anymore. I'm trying to work myself out of a job. Because if you guys learn how to learn and how to find the material that you need to learn, you don't need no stinking professors anymore. Wouldn't that be a nice thing to have? No, yes. Not for me, because I need my paycheck, but it's good for you because you don't need to go to class anymore and you can still learn and you know, keep growing in your career. Does that make sense? Me, maybe. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just kind of illustrating how to find all that information. I could have just told you right off the bat, right? Give you a sample program and just go like, done. But instead, I took you through the park, around the beach, and then hike a little bit up the mountain, and then come back down, and only to find that we are really just one block from where we were. It's called a scenic route. All right. So getting back to what we need to do. So are we okay so far with you know, what your next homework assignment needs to do? More or less, okay, good. So I'm gonna leave it like this, okay? You know, kinda in a mess of pseudocode and you know, just description of what you need to do because you know, the connection of this to the actual code that you need to write is something that you have to do. Okay, it's, it's good exercise, okay, it's good exercise so that you can actually know, okay, but how do I codify, you know, all of this stuff here. Okay, so we are basically officially almost done with floating point numbers. Until this assignment is done, we, we're going to skip, you know, some of the topics. So what we'll do instead from here on is to move on to talk about memory devices. So this is a pretty clean break from what we have been talking about. So we, if you look into you know, all the topics here, so we are now going into von Neumann architecture and memory, um, and starting with D flip-flop and other basic memory devices. 
Okay, so I could have just kind of dive into this and start talking about deep flip flops and stuff like that. But instead, I'm going to take you through another field trip, another scenic route. <coughs> And this has nothing to do with me, you know, just you know, going to the Tahoe area, you know, hunting for aspen, turning uh, color over the weekend. Okay, so the whole idea of scenic route has always been in my head. Okay, it has nothing to do with what I did in the weekend. Right. <laughs> okay, so if 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 the von Neumann architecture is called von Neumann, okay, do you just go like? Oh, okay, it's called the Von, Von Neumann architecture. Or do you want to find out who he is? Okay, I would find out you know, who he is. So Von Neumann, okay. And I have been corrected multiple times by people uh, who actually speak Deutsch or German that is supposed to be pronounced as Von Neumann, not Von Neumann, which is what most people pronounce it as. Okay, so this is the guy, okay, his name is John Von Vonneman, and um, he has a lot of achievements, okay. So when you look at his, um, there are several things that are kind of interesting about him. Um, he was born in Austria, hung, hung, Hungary, um, but he died in Washington, D.C., so he, is a, he was an immigrant. Uh, he also died pretty early. When he passed away, he was only 53. And I'll be there in a few years. <laughs> um, and then you look at his credential, okay? What is he, you know, good at? This is a long list of things that he was good at. He was good at what? Mathematics, and not just mathematics, a whole bunch of branches of different mathematics. Now you have to understand mathematicians are very focused, okay? So you can have mathematicians who earn the field medal, which is the highest honor they can get, in one single field. And that's all they do in, as a lifelong you know, uh, career. This guy is good at what? Foundations, functional analysis. I can't even know, pr pronounce you know, ergodic, ergodic, ergodic theory, representation theory, blah, 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 blah. So he's good at, with abstract stuff. But he's also good at physics. Now, in physics, there's physics, and then there's physics, right? There's Newtonian physics, and there is quantum mechanics, hydrodynamics, and quantum statistical mechanics. What else is he good at? Economics, computing, and here we find the von Neumann architecture. So the von Neumann architecture is one of the many things that he was good at. So now the question is, okay, so exactly what is the von Neumann architecture? Why is this so, such a big deal? To understand why that is a big deal, you can, you can click on this one, okay? And it says, you know, it's a very simple concept, okay? The, the concept is so simple and you're so used to that concept that you go like, so what, right? Because the concept is basically just saying that we have a processing unit we have memory that stores data and instructions. And you know, what the processor does is go to the memory and go like, give me the next instruction to execute. Look at the instruction and go like, oh, I see. You want me to add that and that and then store it over there? OK, we'll do that. When it's done, you go to the memory, get the next instruction and go like, OK, we want to compare this to this. OK, let's do a subtraction. And then the next instruction comes in and go like, I want to initialize that memory to this particular constant, and so on and so forth, okay? It seems so intuitive to us. But if you were him at, in his time, then you have to look at, okay, so what were computers like before he came around and say that, yeah, let's store instructions into memory. What do you think computers looked like at the time? Big and shiny. Huh? Big and shiny. Big and shiny. Big, heavy, shiny with a lot of wires, okay? Why a lot of wires? Because what your, the, the way your computer d did its thing, okay? The, the way those old computers performed their operation was literally hardwired. We are not talking about your PROM, okay? Or your ROM on your, on your motherboard, okay? Where those things are not supposed to be changeable, but you can update it once in a while, okay? No, we are literally saying that when you open up the back side of a computer, you have thousands of wires going in every direction. And those wires 
is sequencing, you know, how things, which operation goes first, the result goes where, and then after that it goes where, and so on and so forth. So what, what is involved to update a program? You have to change the wiring, exactly. And uh, when was the last time you update the apps on your phone? And what, what did that involve? <laughs> you don't even have to click, it auto updates, right? It's over the air, it automatically updates. There's no physical thing that you have to do, okay? Before the von Neumann architecture, every time you want to change, quote unquote, a program, you have to open up a computer and ma make massive, potentially massive changes to the wiring. So we are talking about literally disconnecting a whole bunch of wires, reconnecting those wires in a different way. That is how you update a program. So with that context, we start to understand, oh, so the von Neumann architecture was actually innovative because it allows computers to be updated by electronic means. Okay? Now, back in those days, computers stu are stupid and big and clunky. But at least you can load a program onto a tape and then have the tape to go through a tape you know, uh, player so that you know, the new content stored in the tape can now be loaded into the memory of a computer. And that's how you update the computer. It's still a lot better compared to changing the wirings. Why is that still a whole lot better than changing the wirings? Think about the case when you have like 20 computers and you want to perform the same update to, the, to all 20 computers. If it is before the von Neumann architecture, you would literally have to open up all 20 computers and manually change the wiring the same way 20 times, which is prone to errors, okay? But once you have the way, a way to store instructions into memory and you know, the content can be stored in a tape, then you just have to run that tape on every single one of those 20 machines and all 20 machines are now updated exactly the same way. Okay, so it, it's a big, huge change compared to what we had before. So this is a good context, you know, to um, basically start the lecture uh, of this portion of the class. Okay, so we're gonna, let's get, get rid of some of the tabs that I don't really need. All right, so the first thing we do is to look, to look into what a D flip-flop is. And before we talk about D flip flop, we have to look into what a SR latch is. Okay, so what we're going to do is to look at this thing here, which is kind of like pseudo code, and we want we want to find out what it what it, what is it really saying. If you look at this in object oriented programming, or just your know, basic C plus plus programming, this is saying that we have two NAND two gates. One is called N one, and one is called N two. Does that is that working for you guys? Okay. Uh, we have two input pins, okay? One is S and one is R. We have two output pins, one is Q, one is called NQ, okay? So we're just declaring variables in a very traditional C++ way. And the circuit that you have has a method called add node. So this requires a little bit of explaining, okay? A, an electronic node is a logical thing that connects um, the pins of various components. Okay, so let's see what this is connecting. It's we are creating a new node, okay? New node creates a new object. And what is this node connecting? It's connecting the pin of the input pin S. It's connecting um, one of the input pins of N1 because N1 is a NAND2 gate, it has two input pins. So we can look at in as an array, a member that is an array, and we are only accessing the first member of that array. Is that okay? The next line is saying, okay, the pin of the input pin R is connected to um, the input pin, the second input pin of the N2 NAND gate, okay, and so on. So this is really just a text description of what we normally represent in LogiSim. Are we doing okay so far with the equivalency between the text representation and how we actually draw diagrams? Is that okay? Yep. It's a part of the property. So this is in is a member of um, NAND2, 
and that member turns out to be an array of two items and then each item has a pin as a type so you can connect those things using a node okay all right so if that is the case let's go ahead and see if i can do this part okay so i i want to be able to display both the diagram and the text at the same time i think we can do it we barely have enough room to do it but i think we got enough space there we go all right so the first thing we do is we say there are two NAND gates, okay? Like so. And we'll, we'll label these, one is N1 and one is N2. I could have done it in um, LogiSim, but you know, this is a little bit easier for me to annotate stuff. Now, because it's a NAND gate, it looks like this. It looks exactly like an AND gate. Oh, okay, you guys cannot see that. Um, Okay, I know what to do. Let me do it this way. The razor tool. There we go. Okay, so now it looks better. So the little bubble of the output of an AND gate is a negation symbol. So now it becomes the negated AND gate, otherwise known as a NAND gate, okay? So this is throwing you all the way back to the first class of the, the first time we have a class in this class, okay? Because we talked about the NAND gate. So with the NAND gate, we got two um, input pins. Oops, uh, okay, there we go. So the first input pin is in bracket zero. The second input pin is in bracket one. In other words, I'm really just looking at the input pins as an array of two items. That's all, okay? And then the output pin is just labeled out, I think, labeled out here. And that's how we look at, you know, a, a gate as if it is an object. Is that okay? Any questions about this part? Okay. And we got two input pins. So we'll look at the two input pins. Okay. One input pin, two input pins. One is called S and the other one is called R. Okay. And they have just one single member, which is a pin, is a member. So the pin is really just a connection point that we can connect to other things. And then we got two output pins. One is Q and one is NQ. Okay. I have to be careful where I put it so that you can see it. Okay, so we have two output pins. One is Q and one is NQ. Okay. And once again, they have pins too. So this is the so-called pin, and this is the so-called pin. All right. Now we got the devices, okay, all the individual items. How are we connecting these things? Th those, that's where the nodes come in. So this node, the first node that we are creating, is connecting the S pin, okay, this thing, to N1's in zero, which is this one here. So that becomes what we call a node. Okay, so a node is really just connections between the pins, between the what we also call ports in, uh, in LogiSim. Okay, so that takes care of the first line. The second line says, you know, we want to connect the R pin to the second input pin of N2. Okay, the second input pin of N2 is over here, and the R pin needs to go there. So let's draw a wire over there. Okay. The third line says, you know, the third line says, you know, there, it's a little bit more complicated beca because we're connecting three things, right? So we, we are looking at the output of N1, which is this thing here, and we want to connect it to the first input of N2. So we want to draw a wire like this, but at the same time, it's also going to Q, this is a Q dot pin, okay? So it wants to also go to here. So that's why the third line of the code is creating this connection. Is that okay? It is still called a single node. In other words, if this becomes an actual circuit, it's just a wire or you know, wires that are electrically connected to the output of N1, the pin of Q as an output pin, and also the first input of N2. That's basically what a node is. 
It's just an electrical connection between multiple parts of the circuit. And then the last one is going out from N2 to the second input of N1 and also going to NQ. So what it looks like is this. Now we have what we call an SR latch. How is this different from the other kind of gates that we have seen in this class? I mean, surely the, the carry look ahead mechanism has seen some pretty nasty looking you know, gate logic, right? But this one is nasty in a different way. How is it nasty in a different way? The output of something goes back to the input of something else, and the output of that thing goes back into the input of the first thing. Okay? It's not even a loop, okay? Because a loop is the same device, okay? This is like kind of crisscrossing a loop thingy, right? But it's called an SR latch. Okay. So when you look at this design, let me just ask you a few questions. What if S and R are both zeros? What's, what's going to happen? OK, think about it. S is 0, which means one of the pins of a NAND gate is a 0. What is a NAND gate again? It's a negation of an AND. So you think of it as an AND first, and then you negate the output. What happens if at least one output of AND is false? The output is false. The output is false, okay? But in this case, because it's a negated output, it becomes true. So that means if S is a zero, Q is guaranteed to be one, okay? What about R? If R is a zero, what is that? How is that going to impact you know, the other cir the, the circuitry? If R is a zero, it goes into N2, which is also a NAND gate. So N2 is going to have an output of 1, because it's a negated output. And that one goes to NQ. So we know that if both S and R are 1s, then both, excuse me, if both S and R are zeros, Q and NQ are guaranteed to be 1s. OK, so, so at this point, I'm going to move this back to here, so that we can get a better view. OK, so we'll make a truth table. We have S, we have R, we have Q, and then we have NQ. And then we say if S and R are both zeros, then Q is going to be a 1, NQ is going to be a 1. No problem. OK? What if only one of them is a 0? OK. So we will look at this scenario, and we say, what if S is a 0, but R is a 1? What is that going to do to the circuit? Well, if S is a 0, then it still guarantees Q to be a 1, right? Because if S is a 0, it goes into the NAND gate N1. Because if at least one input is a 0, the output is going to be a 1 for a NAND gate. So that means Q is guaranteed to be a 1. No problem there. What about NQ? Well, let's, let's track our way back from NQ. So NQ is here. It is the output of N2. Now, we already know that this node is going to be a 1, which means it doesn't impact you know, um, the gate itself. But we are also told that R is a 1. So we have 1 and 1, both F as inputs to N2. So if it's a regular AND gate, the output is 1. But because it's a negated AND gate, the output is a 0. OK, so that's, that's, fi that's fine. OK, not a problem. We, we understand that one. If S is a 1 and R is a 0, kind of the other way around, because the, the circuit is actually symmetric. If you draw an imaginary line right here, the top and the bottom circuits are basically symmetric. So that means you know, to work out this scenario, it's really just flipping the other one. So in this case, Q is going to be a 0, and NQ is going to be a 1. Okay. All right. Doesn't sound too bad, right? Now here comes the, ba the really bad boy. 
the bad boy is saying, what if S and R are both ones? OK. If S is a 1, then the only way to determine what the output of M1 is going to be is the second input of that NAND gate. OK? Because if, if you have an AND gate, if one input of the AND gate is known to be a 1 already, then the state or the output of the AND gate only depends on the other one, because one or true and anything is that anything. Okay, so we can't quite tell what the output is just by looking at S, okay? Then we go like, okay, let's look at the other one. But it's the same scenario, because if R is a one, that means the output of N2 only depends on the other pin, which is the output that we were trying to figure out in the first place. So now we go like a, we have a problem. We don't know. <laughs> okay? That is the interesting part of an SR circuit, okay? A SL, SR latch is for three of these rows, we know exactly what is going on. But for the last row, it's kind of like, it kind of maintains what it was. Okay? So what we need to do is to think of transitions. So we'll think of a transition where SR was like this, and then we transition into this, okay? Let's see what happens. So because it's a transition, uh, when S is a one and R is a zero, we will still end up with a zero SQ and a one as NQ, okay? So then what you need to do is you start to label things, okay? So you, you start to label things, and I'm gonna use a different color to label the wires, okay, or the, the state of the outputs. So we know that Q is a zero, okay, and we know NQ is a one, all right? So now suddenly we go, okay, let's transition to the next state. The next state says S is a one, R is a one as well. So we suddenly flip the R pin from a zero to a one. Okay, what is that going to do? Absolutely nothing. Why isn't, why isn't that going to do anything? R was a zero, now it becomes a one. Now when it, when it was a zero, what is happening? When R was a zero, this particular N2 gate is getting two zeros into its input. Now you don't need two zeros to make the NAND gate a one. At least one zero is already enough to make the output a one. So that means when we transition R from zero to one, it doesn't actually change the output of N2 because the output of N1 is still a zero going into the input of N2 and that by itself is sufficient to maintain the output of one from N2's perspective. Is that okay? So that means if I were to fill up this table, I'm just, it's easy, super easy, because we are maintaining the states. What about the transition the other way around? What if we have zero, one for S and R, and then we transition to one, one? Well, let's see what happens. Okay, when S is zero and R is one, we are just copying from the second row of the top table we got one zero over here. Is that okay? I'm just copying this row from here. Okay. And then I suddenly go like, okay, let's erase the green wires, okay, the, the green label, because we then we'll be ready for the other one. Okay, so we erase this. And this time I use a different color. So this way when you're watching the video, by using the color you can you can tell which thing we are talking about. All right, so we'll label Q as one this time, and then we'll label NQ as zero this time. And then we suddenly say, okay, I want, I'm gonna switch the state of S as an input pin from zero to one, okay? Well, but this time you can look at N1 and go like, it had two input pins, both being zeros, and the output was a one, okay? But you don't really need two inputs to be zeros for a NAND gate to output a one. So if I flip S 
from 0 to 1, I still have the output of n2 being a 0 fed into the second input of n1. Oh, so we still have at least one input being a 0, so the output is maintaining to be a 1. So there are no changes to the circuitry whatsoever when I switch from 0 to 1, but this time with the S pin. Okay. Well, I used a different wrong color here, but, I, you know, but it's the same thing. But that's kind of interesting, because when you look at um, when S is 1 and R is 1, sometimes it looks like this, other times it looks like this. Is that okay? So, in other words, in quotes, it remembers what it was like. Yep? Exactly. So, it, it, it remembers what it was when one and only one pin was a zero. And that's why it is the most elemental memory circuit in electrical or computer engineering. Because it remembers. What, I mean, what, what is the definition of memory? You maintain the state of something, right? You maintain the state when something else changes. Well, this is maintaining the state when one of the pins is making a transition. And that's why it's called the lowest level or the most elemental memory device in computer science or in just logic. Is that okay? It's, it's really cool, don't you think? Now, it does beg the question. So we have explored the, the transition where um, R is going from 0 to 1, but S is maintaining you know, its state. We have also explored the transition when S is the one that goes from 0 to 1, R is the one maintaining its state of 1 to 1. What if both S and R transition from 0 to 1? What is going to happen then? <laughs> yep. But yep. If you could do it the other time, you could do that the same zero Okay, so that's a very you, you, you hit the nail. Okay, you hit, hit you hit the nail by saying it depends on the timing. Okay? Okay, so just for kakas, okay, just for kakas, we're gonna explore that particular scenario. So we say, what if, so I'm going to draw the transition here just to emphasize, you know, that's the uh, scenario that we're looking at. So we now say, what if they're both zeros and then we go to one at the same time? Okay, so we know what they look like when they're both zeros. That's not a problem, okay? The question is, um, what do we get here? Okay, so now what we need to do, okay, let me look at the time. We got three minutes. I think we, we're good there. Okay, so I'm going to use green this time. Okay. So we got um, 0, 0, 1, 1 to begin with. Okay? You know, that's just matching the first row before the transition. Okay? So when you make the transition to 1 and 1, okay? So you transition this to a 1 you transition this to a 1, okay? Both NAND gates is, start, is seeing a, a change of the input where now both inputs are 1s, okay? Is that okay? So if both inputs are 1s with these NAND gates, what's going to happen to the output? 1 and 1 is 1, but because it's a NAND gate, you're negating the output so it, they both would transition to a zero as the output. But it takes time, okay? So it takes a certain am amount of time for both outputs to transition to a zero. Okay, so this transition from one to a zero. You go like, okay, that seems fairly easy. We just put down, you know, zero, zero here. But wait, there's more. 
<laughs> okay? Because that zero is not just is not done, although you know it's going to an input output pin that we can observe, but it's also going back, right? So this pin now that is zero is going back to here. And what is that gonna do? And that pin is going back to here, and what is that gonna do? So now the NAND gates go like both NAND gates are doing exactly the same thing. They are saying, oh, I see that one of my inputs is a zero. I need to change my output to a one. And they would do it at exactly the same time. So now both outputs will become, once again, that gets feedback, fed back into the, the NAND gates, and that changes the output to a zero. So it would do what we call, it will oscillate. The output of both NAND gates will oscillate between zeros and ones. Now, whenever we talk about oscillation, we are talking about a repeating pattern, right? And whenever you talk about a repeating pattern, then the next question is, so how fast is it fluctuating, okay? It depends on the propagational delay of the gates. In other words, the moment the input of a NAND gate changes, the output is not changing simultaneously. It takes time for the NAND gate to respond to its input change, and then the output will change after a very short amount of time, typically in measurements of nanoseconds, okay? So that means this thing is gonna change its output from zero to one back to zero and then one and zero and one at a frequency that is really high because we are talking about, uh, talking about a period of nanoseconds. So if the period is nanoseconds, then we are talking about what is one divided by a nano? A nano is 10 to the power of negative nine. So we are talking about, and so t 10 to the power of nine is what? I think it's a giga, right? So we are talking about your know, oscillation in the gigahertz range when you have something like this. Is that okay? Yep, we are out of time. Otherwise, I would explain why there's a propagational delay with a NAND gate in transistor logic, you know, physics thing. But since we are running out of time, I can't do that. All right, so we'll, go, we'll head out to the lab to hopefully finish the negative exponent 10 you know, from last time and then start on the positive exponent 10 that we talked about today.